telling me they love this new Samoa Joe thing. Yeah. They want to give me rock on it. Send us out to Wale. Shout out Rosenberg. Let's do Joe. Joe. It's the super showing up like Lex Luger. Back in the fold, throwing out gold like Medusa. Podcast steadfast. Shout Joe out to FedCast. Kill your whole legacy like the bed did the bad Shanzi in the shotgun. Of course, that's the other one. Three Musketeers up in the sea like Jonathan. Mudo Hashimoto, Ernest Matthews, he like Hase. Parliament Funk, burning a hammer like Kabashi. Come on. Super Show Flow. Super Show Flow. I'm about to wreck the party with my Super Show Flow. I'm about to wreck the party with my Super Show Flow. Let's go. Let's go. How are you doing, buddy? Oh, everything is good. Life is exciting. All those wonderful things. Had Super Show. You've had Super Show 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, but today you not only get Super Show 6, you get Super Show 6 Plus. I am Shotgun Shed, I am your lead in man, I am doing the intro for the show, but I'm not alone. I have the Commissioner Sean Cunningham with me today. Sean, how are you, man? I am good. How are you? Busy, busy good. week. So much to talk about here on Super Super Super, super Show 6 Plus. But you know what makes it plus? It's not just Super Show. It's Super Show Plus because we have the Grime Minister, Luke Force, with us today, too, making it a three-way dance. Luke, how are you? Good to be back in the office. And might I say, pyro, 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 Shotgun <laughs> Shan, Sean Cunningham. It's very, very good to be back at work. And yeah, fuck, man, we got a lot on this format sheet. We have a lot on this format we do, man. We got a lot on this format sheet. And as we were saying before the show started, there is a definite theme to this show, and it's not necessarily the most pleasant one. We're going to be talking about injuries, two major, major injuries in the world of wrestling. One, uh, you know, that deals with more of the mainstream North American wrestling in Seth Rollins. And another that's dev- going to be devastating to those of us that are big New Japan fans and for fans all around the world, that of Kota Ibushi. Two different injuries. They both have an impact on their respective companies. And we're going to get into that in a moment. But I think that the first thing we need to deal with, at least chronologically and at least for the significance to our North American audience, is the injury of Seth Rollins. For those of you that haven't seen it, Seth took quite a tumble uh, in his match with Kane. And this was in Dublin, Ireland. Is this not correct, guys? That is correct. Yeah, and it just looked a little bit like he tweaked his knee, but as it turns out, it was much, much more serious than that. Sean, what are your thoughts? I I don't know. Have, has everybody seen the still that came out of him trying to powerbomb Kane? Yes. And the yeah. position where his knee and his foot were? Mm-hmm. I'm like, that was enough for me. Okay, I'm like, Ew, okay, I don't know if I need to see anymore. And I understand why he might be gone for six to nine months. <laughs> Six to nine months. And it was with torn ACL and what what was the whole thing? There was like three. Uh, ACL, MCL. Meniscus. meniscus. Yeah, and meniscus. So Blew the whole shit up. His entire knee has has been reconstructed. And as, so. ten, as tends to be the case, too, you know, you'll hear this from a lot of wrestlers. And, I mean, just as an example, think about Rob Van Dam back in the ECW days, all the things that guy was doing on a nightly basis. Um, even though, I mean, you know, they weren't running that much, but still, like, they were starting to do house shows around that time when RVD was hot, and, I mean, he was doing the the frog splashes every night, and, and the dives, and even the dives over the barricade, the flip, and what does he what does he injure himself on? What puts him out of action? It was a baseball slide to Rhino on a house show. Uh, yeah, that's Sometimes true. it's the simplest things, the things you've done a million times, and you just land the wrong way. You can step out of bed and do that to yourself, you know what I mean? So that really seems to be what happened uh, on the Rollins front. But anyway, sorry to uh, interrupt there. No, that was actually very valuable commentary. I'm glad you dropped in with that. Because, I mean, these knee injuries are so common. And really, when you look at, I mean, when you look at what these guys do for a living, it's no wonder that the knee is the thing that goes. I mean, it's the joint holding up these guys that are generally a bit larger than what their frame should accommodate. Um, and they're doing kind of athletics and, and, and extending themselves in directions that their body wasn't necessarily meant to be. So it's not uh, it's not a big uh, surprise that it's the knee. But, yeah, looking at that footage, I, I, you know, I remember feeling I've seen that kind of thing before and it turns out to be nothing. But then you see it then and you're like, well, I can kind of understand why things moved in, in the wrong direction. So Seth is down. And, you know, the more I think about it, as much as I feel bad for Seth, I think the timing of Seth maybe stepping out of the spotlight 
Uh, and surrendering his title, not even having to lose it, is not necessarily a bad thing in the grand scheme of things. I think Seth was a little overexposed. What do you guys think at this point? Uh, I think we, we've talked about this on numerous years. I think Seth, Seth was overexposed as a character, not as a worker. And Seth was overexposed as somebody that can't really cut a very good promo. Agreed? And Yeah, but also hasn't been put in a good position. You know, no. and one thing that particularly hurts my feelings is the fact that he's been Triple H and Stephanie's lapdog now for all these months. Of course, with us having the silver lining of him eventually turning babyface and getting to face Hunter at WrestleMania, and we all hoped uh, beat Hunter at WrestleMania and on to bigger and better things for Seth. Unfortunately, now with him being gone six to nine months, and just, I mean, just in layman's terms, okay, regardless of what the actual injury was to that knee um, in terms of the medical terminology, Six to nine months, that's a bad knee injury. Okay, guys that are down that long for a knee injury, that's a bad one. Um, yeah. So, so I mean, he, he's really hurt, and he's out of the picture now. And the fact that that storyline with Triple H is now scrapped or way, way, way on the back burner, that, that sucks. That well, sucks well, for him and his value going forward. Well, look at, it, look at it this way. We talked about six to nine months. Six to nine months now – even six months. Let's be optimistic and say six months. He misses WrestleMania. Oh, yeah. No at question. That point. He's, so, out of, he's out of WrestleMania. Yeah. And that just makes me sad to think about any talent that was that high up in the card being out of WrestleMania at this point. Exactly. I mean, last year, Sean, uh, last year Seth got to do – I mean, he had his match with Orton, which was decent, and then he got his little uh, surprise uh, running at the end. But this really would have been Seth's first big feature singles match at WrestleMania – um, and it's sad to see him lose that. And it's sad to see the flow of, of what they've been building towards kind of fall apart. And we're going to get into that, the repercussions of this, in just a little bit. But right now we've got another injury to talk about. This is one that's hurting all of us and Luke Force probably the most. Luke, do you want to do the lead-in on this? <sighs> I guess um, easiest thing to say, unlike the Rollins thing, that seemed to be one particular spot in a match where he just kind of came down the wrong way and he blew the whole shit out. But it was uh, one move and one moment in a match where things just freakishly went wrong. With Abushi, this guy has been working hurt for a very long time. Put that in your mind when you watch his matches over the last 12 months. Uh, all kinds of stuff, but what has put him out now for what is, I mean, indefinitely, both... Uh, Abushi, this is the thing with his contract, okay? And this is one reason why he has maybe not been given that spot yet. And he's not, he's sort of been hovering around that top mix, but he's never really broken in, never really got the big win over the top guys. He is contracted to DDT and New Japan Pro Wrestling. DDT is the promotion that made him famous. That's how he got into New Japan. But Abushi wanted to keep working DDT and work for New Japan. So that's what he's been doing his entire time there. So that's kind of why Ibushi has never really broken in. Um, and the guy, when he's in DDT, will be working in front of much smaller crowds, but that never registers with him. Um, this is a guy that got banned from the Budokan, one of the most legendary buildings in all of Japan. Uh, Kenta Kabashi, legendary wrestler from Japan, one of the best, one of the best wrestlers of all time, really. When you really want to look at Kenta Kabashi in his career, uh, he was the guy kind of running the Budokan at that time, and he had told Ibushi, because I guess word got out he was going to do a moonsault from the balcony. And, I'm, I mean, we've seen this in ECW, but this was like off of a 10-story building, okay? <laughs> this guy was going to do a moonsault off of the balcony onto Kenny Omega. And uh, Kenny Kobashi basically said, no fucking way you're doing that. You're not risking your life. You do it, you're banned from this building for life. This is on video, folks, okay? This is all over the Internet. Uh, all over YouTube, and uh, Ibushi goes up to that balcony and jumps from a 10-story building, does a moonsault, looks like he's trying to land on his fucking feet, doesn't because he's jumping from a 10-story building, and who can land on their feet? Uh, Kenny Omega does his best to catch him, but there's that moment where the, the camera zooms in on Ibushi, and he has this face like, I know I'm in shit, but damn, that was cool. <laughs> and that's really the best way to sum up Ibushi. He's a thrill seeker. Every single night, that guy's a thrill seeker, and he will just do whatever pops into his mind or whatever he wants to do on that night. He's just, he's like a kid in that way. So Ibushi's been just doing ridiculous, crazy stuff, and uh, what has put him down now is a herniated disc in his neck. 
Mm. When I hear when I hear that, do you know what pops into my mind? That crazy, crazy movie he did that uh, that uh, you and myself and Ernest Matthews watched over and over again, where Abushi did that kind of reverse power bomb over the shoulder into a bridging pin. Do you know mm-hmm. what I'm talking about? The Phoenix, the, the Phoenix, uh, Phoenix Plex, oh, Phoenix bomb, Phoenix bomb, Phoenix Plex, Phoenix Plex. Yes. I, I looked at that move and I thought, how are both of these guys not paralyzed from like just the impact on the necks? So knowing now that he's got this neck injury. And that he was doing these crazy moves. Man, what a, what a crazy dude. Well, crazy, just, amazing, but crazy. Just look at the year he's had. I mean, I was on here just a few shows ago with you, Shan, talking about how this guy's got this resume of 2015 matches. Like, any time you put him in a semi or a main, it's going to be a, almost like a match of the year. And and he's just racked him up, racked him up. Doesn't matter who you put him in there, whether it's a Makabe or a Nakamura or a Tanahashi. All great wrestlers. But, you know, it doesn't matter what style. Anishi, he can work with anybody and have a five-star because he goes out there and he gives it his all every single night. Of course, we admire that, but we also have to be like Abushi. Like, sl- what are you doing? Slow the fuck down. Because now here he is, prime of his career, early 30s. Uh, he was a guy, just as a side note, um, we won't spend too, too much time on this, but I just wanted to bring it up because I think a lot of people may not realize this. Remember when Kevin Owens, Finn Balor, and who was the third that all came in at the same time? Kenta. They all came right. in and got signed around the same time. They were the three musketeers sort of thing of NXT that were all signed from all these different big indie companies and brought to NXT. You know who the fourth was supposed to be? Kota Ibushi. Oh, my God. And the reason he didn't come is because he likes what he's doing. He liked, he really he likes DDT. This is the funny part. DDT is such a smaller company than New Japan. Um, that's the company where, you know, Kenny Omega wrestled the little girl and, and oh, Kota, right, yeah. Kota Ibushi wrestled the blow-up doll. It's a lot of comedy, but they still have a lot of really awesome matches and a lot of great wrestlers. It's fun for him. Him deciding to stay in Japan and not come to the States really did work in his favor with New Japan because they're all about the loyalty. Like, look at Okada. He got the offer from WWE. He said no. He turned it down, and they pushed him to the moon. It's that loyalty thing of, okay, you gave up a chance in the States – we we understand you're loyal to us, and we're ready to go with you now. Um, so with Abushi, he's been working hard for a long time. Look at all these matches he's had this year. It's almost like he intentionally wants to land on the top of his head if there's an opportunity to. We'd almost got to the point where we figured he must have found out a way to land on his head, and and it's just part of his training. He just lands on his head, even with the blow-up doll. You know, he was taking all these bumps on his head, making the blow-up doll give him a, pi- a pile driver, uh, making the blow-up doll give him a, a Canadian destroyer. It's almost like we just assumed that, okay, he's figured it out. He's found a way to land on the top of his head and not hurt himself. Turns out, no, he hasn't. Um, so I love that guy. Um, as much as we can sit here and say, he'll be back, people have done it, look at Austin, look at this, look at that. To say that we may never see this Kota Ibushi again it is a very good possibility. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, because, I mean, he set a standard that you come to expect from Kota Ibushi, and not that you unreasonably expect from him, but one that you know he's expecting from himself. How does he come back and be less than that? Um, that really will be interesting to see if he does indeed manage to come back from such a serious injury. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's a, no timetable, right, for his There's return? no timetable. Uh, both companies have said he's out indefinitely, and he is the top star of DDT. And with New Japan, I mean, as much as they haven't given him the spot, you can tell they've been doing something because he's been he's been continuously getting in these main event title matches with all the different champions, having these killer matches coming very close but not winning. They are telling a long term story with him. Unfortunately, that is now scrapped, just like the Seth Rollins thing, or very 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 on the back burner. I think I even said on a show in the last six months, you know, enjoy this guy while you can. These kind of performers don't last. They they continue and they have careers and even Keiji Muto, the great Muda had some really great matches in his 40s and in his 50s. But the bottom line is he was never that guy that you saw when he came into WCW. He was never that guy that won the G1 in 1995. Um, that guy, and you, nobody can, nobody's prime can go on forever. That's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to say. But it's a, sad, a very sad story. And that means, of course, much like Seth Rollins, Kota Ibushi is out of Wrestle Kingdom this year. It's sad to see that, especially, you know, I mean, I, I'm reminded of Daniel Bryan a little bit. Um, not that Daniel Bryan has ended up in the same situation, but there was always the criticism there that Bryan uh, wouldn't rest his body and wouldn't change his style uh, and that it caught up with him. Um, and, and, you know, oh. it's sad to see a guy. 
it's sad to see someone whose level of excellence is so high that they can't compromise their own safety or that they'll compromise their own safety. So, Dude, Daniel Bryan is the perfect comparison. You are drawing incredible yeah. parallels, yeah. especially because, Sean, like, we don't know if he's ever going to be in the ring again. Well, here's – We don't. Uh, we don't know. Here, here's the thing. Is, is WB as a promoter willing to take the risk on Bryan to bring him back because he won't stop? Right. And, and he's that, had – like, he has had a doctor, his own doctor, clear him. Yeah. Um, it's the WWE that won't clear him. And then that makes you really think, too, you know. Uh, not to interrupt, but I was just going to say, like, you know, about the Austins, the guys that's been able to come back. If it were now, Austin would never clear a medical test to come back in 1997 or whatever. No. That's very true. Very true. You're right. And Daniel Bryan, I mean, we don't know that he'll return ever. His career very well could be over. Yeah, it's a bad time for WWE to be able to make the to try to make this decision uh, using their gut and not their head with all the lawsuits circulating around them and, uh, you know, having a guy with this kind of uh, proven, you know, delicate uh, uh, with his concussions and some of the other things that he's prone to. It is a really difficult time, I imagine, for them to make that decision, despite the fact they need Brian. I mean, at 100% mm. health, Brian would be really uh, well uh, used right now. Dude, they need everybody. They need anyone that's a star right now. Well, I posted a list on Twitter, I want to say at the beginning, at the end of last week. There was an injury list that came out of top WWE talent. Um, guys that are out right now would make a better tournament on their own. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I'm not looking at that list right now, but I, I would imagine so. Yes. Sean, you there? I think we just lost him. Should we hold on and see if we can get him back? Or? Yeah. Okay, uh, Power Struggle 2015. Um, I'll just sort of go through the card here. Obviously, like we usually do with these um, rundowns, we're just going to sort of focus on certain matches that will get the most attention, but I'll just give you the results of the whole card here. Um, show started with Liger, Dorada, Taguchi, and Tiger Mask defeating David Finley Jr., Jay White, Show Tanaka, and Yohei Komatsu, the Young Lions. Uh, young Lions are fucking great. Um, so, second match, uh, Cody Hall, Doc Gallows, Tamatanga defeated Captain New Japan, Juice Robinson, and Togi Makabe. It was a little weird to see Makabe uh, in that match. I'm not sure where they're going with him for Wrestle Kingdom. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, a lot of stuff really did take, take shape, though, for Wrestle Kingdom on this show. Um, they have a formula of how they like to build up their next big shows, and it tends to involve somebody coming down at the end of a match and standing there looking at the guy challenging the guy and it's kind of like you know whether you can speak japanese or not you get it okay this is the challenger for the next big show uh so this happened a lot on on this but i thought it was like perfect you know it was all very organic in a lot of ways the way that these matches have taken shape um what does hakushi mean does anybody know i really don't no but you know what evil means <laughs> exactly <laughs> right so when you hear about a guy named evil you think that's so frippin' corny uh, what a terrible name! The king, the king of darkness, evil, or the prince of darkness, evil, <laughs> and it's Watanabe. Um, it was nice to see Watanabe, though. I was of course. excited to see him back there. You know, we really got to enjoy him in Ring of Honor. Uh, you know, during those shows when we were uh, the live show we saw, and uh, the rest of the North American tour. So I mean, I was glad to see him. But yeah, it was weird. It was that culture cultural gap. That, Is he that, smoking crack? I don't know. What What's with the bags under the eyes? I don't know, man. He looks pretty crazy. <laughs> so, so yeah, for those that don't know, uh, Watanabe, for those who watch Ring of Honor, you, you're very familiar with this guy. Uh, we saw him live, uh, you know, in May at the New Japan Ring of Honor shows. He's a young boy that has gone away on excursion, which is, I think, where Finley, White, Tanaka, and Komatsu are, are just about ready to go. Because if you've noticed, they've got two knee pads now. You know, they're ready to go, these guys. They've got full <laughs> gear, and they're ready to, to be sent off somewhere, whether it's the States or, you know, maybe some they'll be split up, sent some different places, Mexico. But uh, Watsnabi was one of those guys a little while ago, and they sent him off to the States. He really didn't make a lot of uh, waves in, in the United States uh, until recently. He seems to have really appeared a lot on Ring of Honor and, and had some good matches. Sean, you're a Ring of Honor guy. What's your uh, synopsis of Watsnabi? Oh, have we lost him again? I think we've lost him again. Sean? Yeah, you're having some troubles. 
can hear you, but there's interference. Yeah, because you're, yeah. you're having you're having connection problems. I'm having issues. All right. Yeah, you're having problems. So to just log off, I'm just sorry, Shan. Just one sec. I got to just grab my phone to get Sean's number. One sec. No problem. All right, we're back here, everybody. Just had a little bit of a Skype problem. We got Sean on the phone. Sean, you there? Yes, I am. We were just talking about uh, the Haruki Goto versus Evil match from Power Struggle 2015. Uh, you've been familiar with Watanabe over the last few months. He's been on Ring of Honor quite a bit, and you're quite an avid uh, Ring of Honor fan. Uh, what has been your synopsis of Watanabe from what you've seen? I really like Watanabe of what I've seen. Clearly, this is something different. This is a change, mm-hmm. um, and they're clearly building a character over New Japan, and I hope they bring it over to Ring of Honor, but we'll see. So the idea of evil being the uh, henchman of Naito, I don't know that I've really enjoyed it that much, to be quite honest. I don't know that it adds much to Naito. Um, I never really thought of him as a zombie. You know, I never thought <laughs> I never thought of Naito as evil in that way. I always more thought of him as just kind of a jerk off. Um, and this is sort of playing this very dark, again, makeup and all this uh, stuff. Um, I like Watanabe. The idea of Naito having a bodyguard or a henchman or something like that is cool, but just for me, it hasn't really clicked that well. And again, a terrible name for us here in the English market. Um, but to those in Japan that don't know what evil means, I guess it's just a name. So it's that's just a, a name. It's something they've heard in passing and didn't quite quite get. The weird thing too is that Naito is such a real world character, and this yes, evil that's character is not. And so it's a really kind of mismatched gimmick. Maybe it works for the Japanese fans, but for me watching it, I'm like, yeah, he really drags Naito down a little bit. But well, I mean, this was definitely like your typical WWE character revamp. You know, all of a sudden somebody comes out. You know who you know who he is, but he's got a brand new gimmick. You know, it's it's rockabilly-ish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but regarding this match, I mean, I didn't really even really think that much of this match, to be quite honest with you. Uh, it was it was fine. It wasn't it wasn't a bad match. There wasn't a bad match on this on this card, um, but it wasn't really that great. Uh, something interesting that I thought was that it actually ended in DQ, which you never see. In New Japan, it ended when uh, Naito came down and and just kind of went wild again. But this time they disqualified him, and it was one thing I love about New. J- one thing I love about New Japan, uh, many things that I love about New Japan. One in particular, that's a better way to put it. Whenever there's chaos, and in this when there was a DQ, they ring that bell over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know, and, and you don't see that a lot anymore. That used to be a thing in, in WWF. Whenever there'd be some really dastardly thing going on, the timekeeper's going nuts on that bell. Uh, it just adds to the chaos uh, whenever you hear the timekeeper going nuts on that bell. Am I the only one that has ever noticed this? No, I agree with you. I agree with you. And it was very effective in that match, too, because it, get, it reinforces that idea that things have, it's, that it's out of the ordinary and things have gotten out of control. But the, the, the DQ finish is such a mainstay and a staple of this sort of uh, overprogrammed WWE these days that you kind of don't even register it when there's a DQ anymore. So good good for New Japan for making it fresh anyway. Yeah, and then uh, one of the most heated things of the entire night was when Shibata came out after uh, Naito and Evil were double-teaming uh, Goto. And Shibata made the save, and, I mean, the crowd went flipping nuts, and Shibata went flipping nuts. And um, clearly that's a match being set up, whether it's for the Tag League, which is going to be starting in December, or whether it's for Wrestle Kingdom, I tend to think it's going to be something that maybe plays a little bit into the tag league and then is a match at Wrestle Kingdom uh, between Naito and Evil versus Shibata and Goto. 
So, again, a fun undercard match if that is something that they're planning for the big show. Um, next up, Shelly, Kushida, Fish, and O'Reilly versus Kenny Omega, the Bucks, and the Virgil of the Bullet Club, Chase <laughs> Owens. <laughs> They really are becoming the NWO black and white. Yeah. And not the good one either. No, and you know what's funny about Chase Owens? When you see a close-up of his face, he really looks like Shawn Michaels when he broke in, when he still had short hair, you know, before the Midnight Rockers. That, unfortunately, is where the Shawn Michaels comparison's at. Oh, God. <laughs> For poor Chase. I think oh, the, only no. reason, the only reason the Bucks hang out with him is because he does the package pile driver and his last name's Owens. That's the only reason. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the other guy's under contract. But anyways, I mean, this was a hell of a fun match. It's not going to be one of the matches that people are talking about in their first or second breath. But all of these guys are flipping incredible besides Chase Owens. Uh, and it was just so <laughs> fast-paced. Everybody was hitting their shit perfectly. Omega... And his entrance, singing into the uh, broom handle, the operatic yeah. theme. He is so <laughs> he's so good. That Kenny Omega, he is such a heel. He is such an obnoxious jerk. And I just love that guy. And again, I just thought all these guys delivered in this match. What do you guys think? I think it was again. I mean, the thing with New Japan is that in WWE, we would see the eight men matches or the six man matches or the, the, you know, the the kind of multi man matches, and you'd kind of know that nothing really was going to come out of it unless maybe it was a Survivor Series match. But in New Japan, they're always so entertaining and fresh, and they have such huge talent. I can never say a bad thing about these matches, even if in the grand scheme of things, they don't have that much significance to the way things play out. Mm-hmm. Well, but but aren't they? But aren't the eight more matches and the six matches part? That's like that is the New Japan booking formula. That is the way. You, ta- you take the six and eight man match and you turn them into your next four or five big singles matches for the next six months. And they did it in this match. You know, I mean, very simple booking, but logical. Um, Kushida gets the hoverboard lock on Chase Owens. Chase Owens is the fall guy, right? He's the job yeah. boy of the Bullet Club. So, Kushida's the guy that's going to be getting the shot at Wrestle Kingdom. We'll talk about the four matches that have been officially announced in just a second. But, uh, you know, it was made very clear at the end of this match who is being paired off. And it was Kenny Omega and Kushida. And, again, <laughs> add that to the four matches that you've already got or the three matches that are already there. I mean, this is already shaping up to look extremely strong as a card. But would expect nothing less. But, yeah, so uh, Kushida gets the win. And then they do the after the post-match stuff with Kushida and Kenny. Um, next up, the finals of the Super Junior Tag Tournament. Matt Seidel and Ricochet defeated Rapungi Vice, Rocky Romero, and Trent Beretta. Um, I have watched this whole tournament. I know you guys are still kind of catching up on, on the other matches that they had. This is a rock star team. We always use the line, and this is more of a Shan line than me, but I completely back him on it, where he says, you know if these guys went to WWE, they wouldn't do anything with them. I got to say, if Ricochet or Seidel went anywhere, I think anyone would do something with them. These guys are the tag team of the year, and they've only had three matches. <laughs> you know what? It's true. I swear to God, I could probably sit down and watch a match with uh, Ricochet and Seidel against, like, two bags of dirty laundry, and it would still be a really cool and exciting match. Um, because again, it, maybe it's not got the most psychology. They're kind of the perfect team. We talked about this with Gable and, uh, Jordan, where they kind of, where one guy has a shortcoming, the other guy makes up for it. And I feel like Seidel and Ricochet are the same. Um, Seidel is a hell of a worker. He is a hell of a wrestler and extremely athletic. Ricochet is bananas athletic and not as good of a worker as Seidel. But when you put them together, it's just the perfect combination. Do you think if they were on SmackDown, <laughs> they would get a push? <laughs> I think they, I think they would be the biggest tag team in on SmackDown. Yes, absolutely. Okay, can I can I point out that SmackDown was already big maybe and they didn't push him? Different time. That's okay. a completely Agreed. different. That's not a good argument. Completely okay. different time for WWE but, and the but, way but, that they but, do things. But the other thing is what they're doing is so far ahead of what anybody else is doing. I worry that promoters would there's somebody that would miss it and really not know what to do with them. I um, think, I think it is so blatantly sorry again to cut you off, but I think it is so blatantly obvious 
And that's why I say it. I think with a lot of guys, you're right. There's a lot of things that go under the radar. Um, and you could say, well, I don't know about them in WWE. This team, it's just like, it's, it's just coming off of the page. It's something that's like, well, I, I there's no way this doesn't get over with the crowd. But well, maybe I'm, I'm on my own. That, I'm not saying the crowd, it doesn't get over with the crowd. That's not my point. I'm saying in a case, like, especially like WWE, that somebody in the office would decide, yeah, we don't like this. We don't care what our crowd's doing. We don't like this. That's what I'm saying to you. How can you not I'm like not a, it? How, how can anyone not like it? <laughs> because, because Vince McMahon is a 70-year-old man who's out of touch. Well, I agree with you there, Sean. And here's what I'll say if I can interject. As singles wrestlers, I don't think either of these guys would get over in WWE. But as a tag team, I think that you can certainly do. You could do something incredible with them. But who would they fight? I mean, I can't help but look at the tag team division as good as it is. And say, who would they fight competitively? They could have some great matches with New Day, that's for sure. And the Lucha Dragons, I'm sure, could keep up with them to an extent. But I have a feeling those guys will blow everybody out of the water. That's not a bad thing. I'm just saying, going in, it, it would be an interesting an interesting prospect, I think. But they, they, the thing is, they would bring anyone else up, too. That's the thing. That's and and if you can do that, that's you've got a job. Um, I will agree that I don't think Seidel would get a big push in WWE right now as a singles character. I don't think either guy would be getting a big singles push. Ricochet is a star. He's a star. You you look at that guy and you think that guy's a star. He has the body of a star. He has the face of a star. He has the charisma of a star. And his athleticism, again, there's certain things that you can miss with other guys. Ricochet, you can't miss. And I think that the one move in this match, again, it's not about the moves in wrestling, but sometimes it is. And when a guy can just casually run up the corner spring himself to the top rope and do a shooting star probably about as high as Ibushi uh, when he jumped from the balcony straight up in the air and land like it was just basically stepping out of bed. Um, that's something that is is that next level. That's something that's not yeah. – you, you don't see this every day. Um, yeah, fair enough. Can I pose a question to both of you, though? Do you worry that something like Ricochet, that something like what has happened to Ibushi would happen to Ricochet? What do you mean, from all the double moon salts and, and, and triple uh, swantons? No. <laughs> of, of course. Of course. Uh, with that said, he's been doing this style now for a long time. He's only like in his mid to late 20s. Ricochet is. I, I mean, he's, I'd say pretty close to a decade, really, he's been doing this style. And even almost, you know, toning down a little bit now. Um, but anyways, again, we're getting off topic. But I truly believe yeah. these guys could be hired by anybody as a tag team and just be the biggest, most marketable tag team in the world. Uh, another move that these guys do as a team that just blows my mind. Um, you know, Seidel's standing moonsault. And he probably has the best standing moonsault of anybody, I'd say, Seidel. Yeah. yeah. He, do, he does his, his uh, standing moonsault. Ricochet does his running shooting star at the same time. But it's timed. It's almost like Ricochet hangs in midair. He hangs in midair until Seidel's ready to fall, and then they both go down at the exact same time with a shooting star and a standing moonsault at the same time on their opponent. Um, and their opponent's inside gets, gets crushed. <laughs> yeah, but it's just gorgeous. Um, only problem with this match, really, uh, there, I mean, there were a few flubs. Um, the one time uh, Seidel went for his reverse Rana, and um, unfortunately, I guess Trent wasn't expecting it or it was just timed wrong, and that's a scary move to have timed wrong. I'll say that much. Uh, so they didn't get that done, and unfortunately that was in the last few seconds of the match. And then the other problem being that the cameraman, who has caught it perfectly for the other two matches with, that nobody was watching on New Japan World, uh, unfortunately missed Seidel, and you just, you just saw Ricochet's shooting star. But they do the shooting star from two different sides, and they, again, it's timed completely perfectly. I thought this was a really good match. I really did. Very exciting, like Shan says. Fun, fast, entertaining. And and that's pretty amazing that there are two outsiders that have come in and from two different companies even. Ricochet's not a new uh, Ring of Honor guy. You know, he's from the whole Dragon Gate world. He's from the PWG world. He's from the Lucha Underground world. Seidel's from the Ring of Honor world, formerly the WWE world. And there are these two guys that uh, I know Ricochet has said he's been very open about how much of an influence Seidel has been on him forever like that was one of the guys he kind of molded his style after he always thought Seidel had some of the most pretty looking flying stuff so he always wanted to make his stuff really pretty like Seidel in terms of execution so uh, and then they set up what is going to be a four-way I'm not always into these four ways however in this case makes complete sense again perfect uh, logical booking uh, Ricochet and Seidel won the tournament so they want their shot at Red Dragon at Wrestle Kingdom the Bucks are the former champions. They've never gotten their rematch. That makes complete sense. Uh, and then Rapungi Vice beat Red Dragon in the Super Junior Tournament. So they want their shot at the belts. And then who was the final team? 
Oh yeah, Red Dragon. So there you go. So all three, all, <laughs> all three of those teams have a perfectly logical reason to uh, be challenging for the belt. So can you even think about that for a second? Wrestle Kingdom Nine will probably be the opener. Seidel and Ricochet versus the Bucks versus Red Dragon versus Rapungi Vice. That is can't miss right there. You, you, you will have to pick your job off the floor several times. You may just want to leave it there until the match is over. Speaking of picking my jaw up, well, AJ and Fale defeated Chaos uh, members Yano and Hashi. That was not the jaw dropper. Um, but AJ Styles got his win, again, as he always does with the Styles Clash. But next up, jaw drop time. Tomohiro Ishii versus Hanma. Uh, Shan, you're an Ishii guy. Uh, I'm an like Ishii to, guy, man. I, I would just... like to hear your take on this match because I know he always has these very shocking, brutal, violent matches. But this was even a step higher. This was even a step higher. And I remember feeling that way in, in the Makabe match, too, going, oh, this was this is the highest. I've never seen anything like this. And, you know, Ishii's just one of those guys that dishes out violence and at a level that pretty much nobody else does, which I always, the thing I love about Ishii is following uh, Nakamura on Facebook, you get all the behind the scenes Ishii things, uh, <laughs> photos and stuff where he's so very sophisticated, right? And oh, he's yes. very lovely, very well dressed. And he's oh, yeah. very refined. <laughs> you see him in the match and the guy's just, he's just, I, I can't, he just chews people up. And this was no different, but man, it was just violent. It was nasty. The thing about him, too, he's an artist. It's not like we've seen a lot of violent guys in the past. We've seen a lot of guys who could take punishment, bleed, do this and that. But Ishii's an artist, man. And to anyone that says, ah, Ishii matches or Japanese matches, it's a bunch of uh, hitting each other and there's no selling. I'm just going to break some news here on the air. And this is probably actually seriously breaking news to some people that haven't thought about it. Not everyone has the same pain threshold. You could punch Shotgun Shan in the face. You could punch me in the face. I might be down selling and whining and whinging, and Shotgun Shan's just there brushing it off his face. That's right? unlikely to happen, so please don't try <laughs> yeah, it. But... Nobody, nobody be violent to any of us, but or to anyone. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> yeah. Violence is not the answer. But you know what I mean? It's like not every human being has the same pain yeah. threshold. Not every wrestler has the same pain threshold. Ishii will take ten forearms to the face, and again, it's not... You don't know that it doesn't hurt him. You just know that he's not letting you know that it's hurting him. And then comes the 11th one, and he goes to throw one back, and no, he can't because, oh, and that's when he'll sell. The guy chooses the perfect times to decide, it, okay, it, now I'm going to sell in a realistic way, you know? It's called wrestling psychology. It's something that has been lost in North America because all the North American kids are taught sell on the first or second punch. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah, in WWE, everything's like you got to bump on every punch. Right, yeah. you go. You watch a lot of WWE matches. They're bumping on every single punch, and Ishii just has a very, very different outlook and a very different psychology. And a lot of people will watch it and say this has no psychology, but they're wrong. Um, and he's still like whether he's ever healed his uh, shoulder from the G1 two years ago or not, we don't know because he never took time off. But he'll always go back to that shoulder when he's just like at, at the perfect times. Um, a flying headbutt from the top rope, the Kakeshi drop. To the outside. Is this Why? something any human being should attempt? Hell I no. Would, I would say no. As we're, as we're dealing, as we're talking about injuries, uh, some of these serious injuries that have come up, you see something like that, and, and it just puts it in a different perspective. Certainly entertaining, but, man, I'm not sure it's worth it. They have something with Hanma that's so special, too, because it's like you get tricked every time. You get tricked every time, you know, you, you know that he's not going to win, but then they get you to that point in the match where you're like, I actually think it's going to happen. And then it doesn't. And you're just like, I'm so stupid. But then the next match happens and you do it again. I, I, I don't every, know. Every single time. Did every I, time. But that's so hard to do, you know? And I guess in, in the difference is that in WWE or in North America, for the most part, like a Santino or someone like that, they're never going to let him have that match. They're never going to let him go 30 minutes or however long that match went. That's the difference. But he's in that same kind of role. He's that comedic, sympathetic, but, you know, you don't ever think he's really going anywhere babyface. And in this match, again, they really made you believe it. So just to keep this show moving, next up, uh, Tana, Hashi, and Shibata versus Sakuraba and Okada. Flipping awesome match. Awesome match. And and the way that they're building this Tanahashi Okada match at Wrestle Kingdom is is just so intense, so good. These guys have had all these different matches, but it still feels intense, and it still feels like, man, I can't wait to see this match again. Uh, I just thought, especially the post match of this. I mean, there was times when I thought this isn't this isn't a work. You know, these guys are are pissed at each other. And and it, and if wrestling can do that in any form, then they're doing the most amazing thing you could ever do. 
causing you as a fan to suspend belief. You know these guys, like, like this is not their personality. And I think that's really what makes you bite on it, is that Okada, we're not used to him screaming and kicking railings and, and flipping out and having, like, that was such an amazing pull apart, honestly, at the end, that was so awesome, on the outside. And then having it end right at the end, you know, where uh, Tanahashi looks like he's just, like, you know, Okada's already in the back and Tanahashi's just kind of starting to calm down. And then he breaks from the crowd and the last thing you see is him run to the back. And you can just imagine in your head, okay, I'm not going to ever see this, but there's a real fight going on back there right now. That yeah. was the way it felt with that that finish. Um, so anyways, yeah, Tana and Shibata won the match. Um, and not really sure what, what's going on with Sakuraba right now. The match they had planned was supposed to be Kota Ibushi and Sakuraba, and obviously that's off the table. So not sure what's going to happen there. Um, but anyways, uh, on to the main event. So yeah, again, Tanahashi Okada, I'm ready again. They have classics every time, but this one just feels so intense. And you know, deep down, there probably is a competitive rivalry with these guys and the whole Sean and Brett thing. You know, the younger guy that's kind of getting tired of this guy still standing at the top and, and blocking his way as being the guy. And uh, and then Tana being like, I'm not I'm not stepping down until I'm ready, and, and you're going to have to wait there, young fella. But again, just to see them out of their personalities and Tanahashi's not smiling and Okada's not being cocky, they were just, they lost their tempers. Um, I love that. Um, main event time, though. Shinsuke versus Carl Anderson. Another great Shinsuke match for 2015. And, uh, you know, uh, Carl Anderson. What's your what's your take on Carl Anderson? I'd like to just hear uh, both of you uh, give your take on Carl Anderson as a worker. Well, I love Carl Anderson. I mean, Carl Anderson is one of those guys that's hard to take seriously at first. He has kind of a comedic way about him. And anything you see behind the scenes with him, he plays that up. In the ring, he's quite a solid worker. Mm -hmm. He's quite solid. And it's it's almost that um, change between uh, his his out of ring demeanor and his in ring abilities that's always uh, it draws me in a little bit. I'm always feel I always feel a bit surprised when I'm watching it. A couple of years ago, when he did the short little beast run in arc, I love his work. The character seems to work for him, but I really think he could be a viable like. Could you use him as like a floor or heel champion somewhere? I really do feel as though he could be a top guy, and he has been in the past. Um, you know, we had that one G1 final against Okada and everything, which was another great match. He's very underrated. He's one of these guys who will sort of play his role, but if you give him that shot for a show and say, okay, you're in the main event against so-and-so, he's going to go out there, and he's going to really impress, and I thought he really did. Um, but again, this is the sound of me kissing Gato. Okay. Yes. <laughs> because of the ending. Because of the ending of this match. Of course, Shinsuke wins. Carl does not take the belt. He, he wins with the Bamaye after a lot of near falls and all, all kinds of great stuff. And then Shinsuke is sort of selling in the ring. The Bullet Club's all there checking on, on Carl. AJ's got a, a hat on backwards, and he was not a focus of this match in any way. It was almost like you didn't even really realize he was a part of that group of guys that were out there. I think they kept, they kept the focus off him on purpose, I think. Yeah, kind of... and, yeah. Yeah, it was the same thing. And uh, then when he, they were in the ring and they were all sort of standing around Carl, who's still selling, laying on the on the mat, um, I realized that I was like, oh, AJ's out there, but they don't seem to really be focusing on him or anything like that. And then it shows Nakamura and he's laying there and he's selling. And then you just see AJ Styles step in front of the camera. And I mean, the crowd is just Whoa. that sound that you can only hear from Japanese wrestling when something really cool is about to happen. Something that you want to have happen, or when something really cool is happening. Um, and this was something cool about to happen, and then it was something cool really is happening. And he stepped up, and just taking those few steps into Nakamura's personal space, let everybody know the match, the dream match, is on for Wrestle Kingdom. And yes, it has been officially announced. Uh, Shan, we're getting the match. Oh, that's going to be an exciting one, because that's a mix of styles and a mix of, of, of just positioning within the company or within companies that they're involved with. These are two guys that um, it's going to be hard to call it. You can't sit down and go, who's the most over or who's the most prestigious, who's going to lay down for the other guy. I think we're going to see two, two real, um, you know, forces go head to head. And it's, it's quite exciting. And there was a press conference right after Wrestle Kingdom with uh, AJ and Nakamura after the match had been announced. And I don't know if you guys realize this. I didn't, actually realize it but i kind of had figured it aj styles and shinsuke nakamura have been in the ring in their entire careers one time and it was 10 years ago it was i believe kurt angle and who was it it was kurt angle and somebody versus no it was uh kurt angle and shinsuke versus aj and 
I want to say maybe Tanahashi. Um, let me know, everybody. I think I'm going to have to go find it on YouTube. I know it's there. But it was a tag match when they were still – remember there was the TNA New Japan involvement there for a while yeah. in the mid-2000s? Oh, that's right, too. And AJ mentioned it in the press conference that they've been in the ring one time, and it was when they were kids. He said that we were both kids back then when we were in the ring in that tag match. Um, they have kept them – AJ's now been in there two years. They have kept them apart, even though the, both at the top of the mix – and they have not touched. They have not even been in a tag match. They have been completely separated, and now here they are. All it took was AJ walking up to Nakamura as he was sort of starting to get up, and everybody knew what that meant. So. And can I find out what AJ has over a three-week period then? Because uh, he is scheduled to fight Jay Lethal yes. the week before Christmas at Final Battle, and then he's going to go fight Nakamura on, at Wrestle Kingdom. So, at Wrestle Kingdom on, on, on January the 4th. January um, 4th. What I'm hearing is that Jay Lethal will be defending the Ring of Honor title at uh, Wrestle Kingdom as well. Really? So, wow. Yes. So I don't know who it's going to be against exactly, but whether it be a Ring of Honor guy or a New Japan guy or an outsider or what. But latest I've heard, yes, a, uh, Jay Lethal will be at Wrestle Kingdom, and he will be defending the Ring of Honor title. But that's not official yet. Oh, my gosh. Now, guys, let's, let's jump into this whole... WWE controversy and and Seth Rollins is out and we've got a tournament which is always I mean that you can't really get any better than that a tournament for the world title uh, maybe you could say that the the brackets or some of the people involved are a little questionable in terms of being uh, world title contenders but uh, who in, wants, in who first, wants to go first in the first okay well let let's just say I mean obviously the, the Seth Rollins injury has has uh, thrown everything into chaos. We were originally going to have Seth against uh, um, Reigns in the match that I guess we'd all figured was going to be the build toward uh, Reigns getting his title run, or at least shortly thereafter, or something was going to happen. That's all gone out the window, um, and now we have this title tournament, um, in which Reigns is involved in, and we can only expect Reigns is going to at least get into the final round. But what's going to happen beyond there is that there, there's been a lot of discussion between, you know, at least uh, Luke, you and I have talked about what we think is going to happen. And I think Sean's had his input on that, too. Where do you guys see this going? I mean, admittedly, there was a lot of um, filler in this tournament, but I think most of that got pushed out in the first round. Um, what are the brackets going into the into the, the going forward from here? Reigns versus Cesaro, Kevin Owens versus Neville. Dolph Ziggler versus Ambrose, Callisto versus Alberto Del Rio. Ah, uh, Callisto, right, Callisto, Mister, he ain't gonna win it. Uh, <laughs> but, and, and Neville as well. I think we can kind of take Neville out of that bracket. But I mean, the interesting thing is here they've put. I mean, we can, we can. I think we should assume that Reigns getting into the finals is a given. But on the other side, you've got Ambrose or Owens. Um, I think we've talked about the fact that this is Roman Reigns has really struggled with the fans. And we've, you know, we've heard that Vince is dead set that he's going to continue pushing Reigns. And I feel that that's a mistake. I think that keeping Reigns, uh, turning Reigns heel and letting him have a big run as a big heel would benefit him hugely. If they were to go forward with that at Survivor Series, it would be really cool to see the Rock's cousin turn heel and join the, the corporate uh, authority um, in the main event against a friend. Uh, if he was to turn against Dean Ambrose, if Ambrose was to get into the finals. But, you know, I think you pointed out, Luke, that maybe they're just going to stick with Reigns as a face and turn Dean. And I, one of the more I thought about that, I thought this is kind of a no-lose situation because if they turn Reigns heel and give him the title and make him the big kind of focus of, of the authority, not only does that give Reigns a, a, a huge push it also sets it up for when seth comes back for maybe seth to go back to being a face and it lets dean have a stone cold-esque run against them but if they turn dean heel we get the dean ambrose we've been waiting for um and i think uh, as maybe one of the premier villains wwe you could pump out at this time uh, in their uh, in their roster what do you guys think what's your feeling going in who i mean owens is in there as a wild card but i still think it comes down to ambrose and reigns what do you think sean go ahead well, I mean, I look at it, the way the office seems dead on, they, they want Roman Reigns a baby face, and here's your problem. If it's Ambrose or Owens that he faces in the final, the, either one of those two guys is going to get cheered over Roman Reigns. Agreed. That's exactly it. You're right, yeah. So, I don't, but the thing is, WB seems to have made their bed already. And they made that, that pretty clear on Monday with that 10-minute promo at the beginning of the tournament. 
See, I feel like the promo was hinting that he is going to turn. Isn't this very, very similar to what happened with The Rock right before uh, Survivor Series 98? Weren't they kind of courting The Rock and trying to draw him in and he refused and then went on to actually join them? No, what they did was they said, we know you're the number one contender, but screw you. Okay, and then he right. joined them anyway. Okay. It was, a, it was a little bit different setup. But I'm looking at it going, but they, but everybody knows it. they are so hyped on Roman Reigns. They don't care what the fans are going to do anymore. They're just going to lay a Roman down their throat. Do you really think that's true? Do you, do you really think they don't care? Do you really think it doesn't sting every time they push him to a higher level and the fans re- reject him? Like, I got to think somebody back but there. The thing is, but I think you've got enough fans now that won't reject him, but it won't sound A, as bad on TV, and you don't have the real kids during Cena to put that up against. Well, Cena's that's true. not there. And I think that n- nobody's talking about how big a deal that is, that Cena's not there, and you need to make a new baby face, period. That's right. Uh, and that's the way, that's really what it comes down to for me, is that if it's not Reigns as the top baby face, does that mean that Vince is now saying, okay, you know what? Now, now, mind you, this is what we all think he sh- he should do. As fans, we think this. Yeah. But, you know, is Vince really going to say, okay, I'm ready to go for something different now. I'm ready to have a different kind of top baby face, a Dean Ambrose, a gritty, more edgier top baby face. Nothing, no, nothing has really shown me that that's, there's going to be a huge change of direction under Vince right now. And I feel like, you know, Vince is obviously privy to a lot of things we're not. Most obvious statement I could possibly make on the air. But he's not necessarily, and I think the John Cena run for the last 10 years should show everybody that Vince is looking at the spreadsheets. He's looking at the big picture. How much merch is this guy drawing? What are the ratings like when this guy's on TV? What are the buy rates like when this guy's on a main event? And that's how he's making his decision. And people can boo. Um, The thing with, with, with Cena, though, that's different from Reigns, I mean, there's a lot of things different, but one in particular is that Either way you look at it, whether it was a positive or negative reaction, it was always a really heated reaction for Cena. Yeah. And so you always felt like whether, you know, whether the fans or the, the male audience or the loud fans or the vocal minority, as a lot of people have said, um, whether they're really represent, representative of the overall business is, you know, debatable. But with Cena, at least when he came out, it felt like a really big deal because clearly this place has been whipped into a frenzy over this guy in one way or the other. With Reigns, you don't have that. And I thought it was funny on, on Monday with that opening segment that the fans really got into the idea of him turning heel. Did you notice that? Yeah. 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 Uh, the fans in the UK were like, when they started teasing of, of Reigns going with the authority and being the new heel, they were like, we love Roman Reigns. When he did the good beaver cleaver, they kinda, well, I they need to stand up for it. what's right, they crapped on it. And, and you know what the office spin is, right? We all know what the office spin is. Well, I, I would assume it's similar to what I said in terms of, you know, the merch well, no, and all it, that stuff. But what were you no, going to say? The office spin, no, the office spin to the reaction on Monday yeah. was, it's the UK, ignore it. That show was Wait hard to watch, back too. To the States. You know, in terms of the audio, they were just so all over the audio, constantly turning down the audio, I guess because there were lots of uh, vulgar chants, et cetera. But inappropriate thing. Inappropriate thing. But, I mean, the heat for that show was nothing like it came off on TV. On TV, it came off like a pretty dead crowd, and it wasn't. Well, I don't know. I mean, if that's the plan, then, to go straight ahead with Roman as the face and either turn – I mean, if you turn Dean heel – and Roman is the face. I have a feeling it's going to backfire on them because I think, I think well, it's Dean. Totally, it's totally going to backfire. I think Dean has a certain level of appeal that may not translate into money, uh, or not that he's really been given the chance. To be perfectly honest, uh, it's again, it's the Cena situation where they're putting out some big merchandise for Roman Reigns that isn't equaled by anybody else. So saying that it sells better is more reflective of the product than the guy. I think, but. Um, like my feeling is if you, if you turn Dean heel and, and you put him up against Roman, I have a feeling it's going to turn ugly and they may have to go through everything they've gone through before. Um, and as you said, Cena would get a passionate reaction. Roman may not. Roman may fizzle right out again. The other thing too is like we're talking about we need a new top face. The Cena's only gone for how long? Like six I weeks. For three, four months. Oh, yeah. I heard he was coming He's back in December. I guess we see where it goes. I just can't help but feel the history of this of this show uh, that 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 they they like to have they like to go back and relive their past. And I have a feeling mm-hmm. at least somebody there has said we've got the Rock's cousin in a tournament at Survivor Series. 
and this would be the time to do it. I think, either, as I said, it's a bonus either way. As long as somebody gets turned, they need a good turn. They need a good shakeup. I'd be totally happy if Dean becomes a sinister, vicious, uh, crazy maniac that we know he can be. The oh, only yeah. question, the only question I have there is, can you put a character like that with the authority? Does it work? Um, no. So yeah, see, it doesn't really. So no. I don't know. We'll see I, I will, listen, anything can work, Sean. I understand why you say no, though. You're you're not saying no, it can't work. That's not the way they do things, and that's kind of the way I am too. Like with with Shan saying, you know, really pushing the Roman Reigns thing, uh, turning heel. It's not like I'm saying Shan that can't work. That's not going to work. I think it would be awesome. I think it would be great. But the bottom line is, do I have faith that that's what they're thinking right now? I'll tell you this much. No. Listen, listen, though, I will say this much. If you think that that's not something at least being talked about, you are naive. Of course it's being Agreed. talked about. Everything's being talked about right now. Everything. Okay, do you believe that they have any type of plan going past November 22nd? They're putting it together. You know, No, the entire Mania plan has been blown up. That should be yeah. very apparent at this at this point. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of there was a lot of talk that it was going to be Cena and Roman Reigns at WrestleMania, and yeah. if you were to turn Roman heel at, at Survivor Series, have him win the belt, go on face Cena. I mean that that's a pretty logical one. But I've also heard they are talking about John Cena versus the Undertaker, oh, fin- doing that one finally. Latest I heard about The Rock, he will not be wrestling at WrestleMania, and really doesn't even feel like he can work it into a schedule to be there uh, for WrestleMania. So that's that's fine by me too. No offense mm-hmm. to The Rock. No, I no, think- no, no, no. I think I think the best thing for them to do right now would be to make do to the fullest extent with the talent they have on the card because I think they'd surprise themselves. They've got some biggest big, WrestleMania, big stars. biggest WrestleMania of all time. Biggest WrestleMania. This of all is time. not the time for that. <laughs> not the time to. Build. I completely agree, but it's like, you may not what else do you do? What else do you, you do? You need something, man. You're gonna have to bring in something, and I don't yeah. know who. I don't even know who. If you don't have The Rock, you don't have Austin. Undertaker. Gonna be a, Undertaker's gonna not be drawing. There. Well, he's not going to be wrestling, though. That, that's the point. He's going to be there. He's going to come out. He's going to say, oh, hell, yeah, he's going to drink a beer and, and flip a bird. He's that's That doesn't sell tickets. That doesn't what, sell. That doesn't what, are the options? what are the options? You get Shawn, I don't Michaels, know. To come, I get don't Shawn know. Michaels to come out of retirement? And what they could have Daniel Bryan back in. I mean, those are two names that, he, I mean. He has turned it down every time. He shuts I know it he's down. turned it down every they've time. Had, they've had a million ideas for him, including that to, Daniel I, Bryan. I, I hate to bring it up, but I have to. CM Punk? Can't <laughs> It'll never yeah. happen. Never yeah. happen. Right. They're sounding pretty desperate. And to anyone that wants to say, you know, Alberto, we all said that would never happen and it happened. Let me just tell you a little something about the Alberto thing. And, uh, again, great fucking show, guys, last week. One thing I will disagree with, though, Sean, is that you kind of hinted that Alberto maybe was a little too sensitive and he came to his senses and he asked for his job back. I want to clarify what happened with Alberto Del Rio. Okay, Alberto, good. Alberto, <laughs> Alberto didn't call anybody. They called him. They, they called him. They offered him a good deal. They gave him a better schedule. You know, we want to have the top Latin star. We don't have one right now. Yes, you have the Lucha Dragons, but I mean, they're let's, not, they're let's, not be, let's be honest. Yeah. yeah. Um, they want the top Latino star for that demographic. Alberto is the guy. Um, Most definitely. Most definitely. Anyone that saw the work he did in Ring of Honor, the work he yeah. did. In Lucha Underground, for God's sakes, this guy is a star. You just have to know how to use him. You have to know how to direct him. You have to be able to let him be himself. Go out there. He can cut a great promo. They just don't Why is he do stuff? that. And Why then, is he with Coulter? There you go. Are they using him to the best of his abilities? No. They signed him to that deal. God bless him. He said in all of his interviews post uh, WB, he gets along great with Vince. He was always a Vince guy. Everything he did was through Vince. He was Vince's project. He didn't really even deal with Hunter, and without saying it, you could tell he really didn't like Hunter. Yeah. Um, so he has always dealt with Vince. He said Vince always treated him great. Vince was awesome. And in terms of this deal, like, I mean, I think he probably said, I'll come back, and, yeah, I'll take this deal, and, okay, great. Um, but I want to deal with Vince. I don't want to deal with anybody else. And, you know, we get along well. So, I mean, he never was burying the company. He was burying that guy who has been gone yeah. now. He's been gone for months, that guy, too, Cody Barber yeah. or whatever. Yeah. He yeah, was fired. He was fired months ago. So he's gone. He's out of the picture. And uh, Alberto has that ability to go in there and sort of deal right with the top guy. But yeah, then what do they do? They bring him in and they automatically are trying to tell the narrative of there's no racism. They're trying to get away from all the Donald Trump stuff right now. 
Right, but you can for, tell you can tell because of the way Alberto left the company that they wanted to do something to be like, there's no racism. Look, uh, this guy was supposedly part of the Tea Party, and, and he, he now they're buddies, and they're going to be this thing called Mex America. They did not yeah. bring Alberto back in the best scenario. I'll tell you that much. No. no. I think they're treading water right now and clearing the air, and then I hopefully they're going to do something else with them. But the reason that I said it'll never happen with Punk, and the reason that it's so different than the Alberto thing, is Punk really has something else going on. Oh, yeah. And I'm not sure he would sacrifice his UFC um, debut and the training he's doing and, and, you know, sacrifice his health for one match at WrestleMania. I just don't see him coming back for that unless they gave him an insane amount of money and maybe uh, Hunter rolled around in, in dog shit in the middle of the ring or something like that for him. I, then, then, maybe he'd go, then maybe he'd go, yeah, OK, I'll do it. But we also have to we also have to bring up the fact that Punk's hurt. Yeah. So yeah, he's, his enough. UFC debut has been pushed back because of his injury. So. This yeah. guy, this guy's I'm not here. coming back. Again, I'm just trying. To, everybody's talking about this needs to be the biggest sure. WrestleMania of all time. That's it. But you, you're running out of legends to bring back. No, you're right. You're absolutely right. And him, he would be a great choice if he would be willing to play ball. There's also a lawsuit. You know, yeah, the there's a lawsuit. Name there. I can, the only other name I can think of, and I thought about this because it was Texas, was Ray Mysterio. Right. And what does that do? Nothing. Not much. I love Not Ray. Enough. I love Ray with all my heart. And you can't no. bring Batista back because Batista's no. in all. Not that he would draw, but I'm just saying you can't bring Batista back. This is no. really where the chickens come come back to roost now. Damn and right. Getting, you're really getting to look and go. Well, you know what, guys. All those years you spent not building <laughs> up these guys, now all of your your old go tos are gone. They're off doing other stuff. And you know, look at the guys you could have made huge stars. It's not too late. I mean, between now and WrestleMania, if they did it, that's why I can't help but think that they're going to turn reins. I just feel like that at least gives them Man. something big, you know, a yep. big new evil yeah. champion and put him against Cena. That sounds like a big match. Do you know what I mean? What's the attendance for Cowboy Stadium, Sean? What are they hoping to draw? 100, 100, 120. So by far the biggest crowd ever for wrestling. Yeah. Uh, well, and, the stadium for football holds 100, over 100,000 alone. Right, and that's well, what they're hoping to do. Seats. That's what they're hoping to do. And anything less is going to be a failure to them. They're going to feel as though yeah. that's a failure. So, yeah. yeah, what do you do to pop business right now? You're right. I mean, you're absolutely right, Shan. But then the question is, like, who is the top? They, I guess Cena. But you're going to have to really heat up Reigns, and, and then, which they will. But uh, to the listeners, i got to ask you. What do you think WWE should do in the next few months to pop business for WrestleMania and the biggest attendance of all time? I agree with you, Shan. They need to build, and they should have been building forever. But is this enough time to do it? Is this enough time to get anybody hot after the way they've been treated? Let, let, let me put this to you here. When they're sitting in the office and they're having this discussion that we're having now, except with a much more frantic nature, right? <laughs> Um, and during that discussion, do you not think that there's at least half of the room when the people are sitting there, kind of, you know, throwing out their ideas that's going, if we put Roman Reigns in the main event at the biggest WrestleMania of all time and he gets a lukewarm reaction or a shitty draw or a terrible draw? Yeah, we are going to be fuck? tanked. We are going to be tanked. I, I'm going with a Reigns turn for that reason alone. That's what I'm saying right now, because at the very least, you could have a hot heel. And he needs it. God, he needs it. So that's what I'm saying. I, I don't disagree with you. I just know we, we've all heard the same things. We've all heard what they want to do so desperately. Are they willing to do the 180 this close? But, are, but also, are they, are they smart enough to see far enough ahead that go making him a huge heel now gives him the opportunity to be a great face down the road? Are they willing to wait? Uh, like, like months you, or two years. You like know? you said, those exact words are being have been said. It's just a matter of if Vince is in that mood where he's like totally shut that door, then it's just a waste of breath. And and yeah. uh, I don't know. I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, you know you, what the thing is too. The, the, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Th this would have been the year to have Sting make his WrestleMania debut yep. and to use him properly instead of doing what they did, kind of devaluing him, throwing him away, and then having him pretty much his career be ended. I mean, that would have at least been one name they could have thrown yep. in as a big deal for WrestleMania, and now they don't even Absolutely. have that. Absolutely. Is there anybody out there just straggling on the fringe that they could bring back? I don't think there is. Goldberg. Yeah. Goldberg. I don't Goldberg. think so, guys. I, I, I don't, don't like, think I, so. Hey, you told me to come up with a name, I did. Sean, I think, I think you're right. <laughs> I hate to say it, but, I mean, uh, who else? Who else? 
that oh. could still get in there. Can't be valued or can't do it. Exactly, oh. can't do it anymore. Like you can't bring somebody in that's broken down. We don't know exactly what Goldberg looks like right now in terms of how he moves in a ring, but you're right. Actually, you're fucking right. That is the one name. And you know what? I have heard WWE has been making a lot of calls to a lot of big names in the business. What that like means? Who? What that means? I have no idea. I just know that they have who been else? called. They have been calling anybody and everybody, and this is definitely a huge shakeup going on uh, backstage regarding this and regarding WrestleMania and regarding everything. Because Seth played a big well, part into WrestleMania as well. Remember that. When you, when you say calling everybody, what do you mean by everybody? Well, that's the thing. Legend, if, if I knew, legend, I could le- break it on the air. If I knew, le- I could leg- break it on the uh, air. Uh, okay, but legend everybody or every indie worker they don't have a contract. Well, I'm sure they're not calling Hacksaw and it's <laughs> fucking Tatanka. <laughs> if that's what you mean. No, I'm saying. What about Mikey I'm Whipwreck? Saying, <laughs> no, I'm saying. No, but I'm saying, are you calling every guy that has, is on the fringe market at Ring of Honor? Are you calling Jay? No, Lee? those guys don't. Those that's not what they want. They want somebody with a name, somebody with a name they can bring in, but not somebody with a name they can bring in that they can't control. There won't be any Nakamura's there. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? There, there's not going to be anything like that. Yeah, they I'm want. Just, I'm just saying, like, you, you've either devalued every legend. Yeah. Exactly. Or they've refused you. Or they yeah. just there, can't go there anymore. Two, or you've two, broken them down. Seriously. Or you've broken them down. Taker's broken left. down. Sting's broken down. Who Who are the two names? Goldberg and could, that, could, that could go. Who? Maybe Bill, we don't know. Maybe. And the other is Shawn Michaels, who keeps turning it down. Who keeps turning it down. If it was a real huge favor, maybe maybe Vince could get him to pull maybe. it in. But then who's Sean gonna fight? Unless you can get Brian to come back too, and then that's then Sean that's a fight? main event match. Yeah, yeah. Who is Sean gonna fight? And if Brian yeah, only has one more it. match, why can't it be with Sean? Yeah, and you know who it would have been if it wasn't Brian? It would have been Seth. Yeah. That was, yeah. You know, that was the match they kind of set up a few weeks back. Unless you have Sean come back and retire Undertaker. I actually pitched that to you, Sean, didn't I? Yes, yeah. we did. We talked about that. And then, and then <laughs> Last pay per view. That's weird. Yep. Chance didn't even know about that. No. Yep. Last pay per view. I talked about that. As the yep. show was going on, I texted Sean and I said, "Don't ask me why. This is probably something to just discard." I oh, think day Sean. Before. Yeah. No. As the show was going on. Yeah. And I said, Sean Michaels is going to return tonight. He's going to cost Undertaker the match, and then they're going to have the retirement match at WrestleMania. He's going to retire Undertaker. Yep. Uh, Ric Flair was retired by Sean Michaels. Yes. Shawn Michaels was then retired by The Undertaker. So yes. so so Michaels Michaels absorbed Flair's energy, got the rub from Flair, and then a few years later retired to The Undertaker, who didn't need that rub either. And so nobody got the rub. People still are sitting around. I don't understand why there's no stars in WWE. Because yeah, there's, no, there's no lineage. There's no lineage. Okay. okay, here's what you've done. Taker lost his streak to Brock Lesnar. To Brock Lesnar. Who doesn't need it. Nobody has gotten the rub, the real top guy rub from anybody in a decade or more. That's true. That's <laughs> true. I guess Cena. Cena was the last guy, wasn't he? Or no, no, you know what, Batista. They did give him like the top guy treatment in that way. But they did. That's well true. Cena, Cena tried to build a bunch of guys over the last six months and it no, hasn't Cena's, done it, yet. Cena's done it on his own, but yeah, it's been all resistance. Yeah. But I mean Owens is coming along, but still, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree with you guys. So, um, again, we'll, we'll wrap this show up, but just, I mean, I'm just going to say this about the Reigns thing. I still believe he will be a baby face at Survivor Series. I do believe that there's going to be a turn, which I think there probably will be. It will be Ambrose. Um, but then, I mean, if it's not that, or if they're just going to have Reigns win the title as the baby face, which I kind of originally predicted, the question is, then what? Exactly. Right? What's Who's I mean, his next nothing. opponent? Yeah, but, I mean, no, even just, like, just trying to pull anything out of your ass. Reigns wins the title. He has his big Excalibur moment at Survivor Series, not WrestleMania, right, as was originally planned. He's going to win at Survivor Series, and then Because wins. you have no option. <laughs> What's the WrestleMania program? What's, you know, how do we keep him a strong champion until WrestleMania? Um, there's, it just seems like such a, a interesting predicament. I mean, it's going to be a really... Uh, really eventful shows, podcasts that we produce, I think, over the next few months because of stuff like this. Everything's up in the air right now. They don't have a top heel. They don't have a top baby face. And I, and I wonder about all this injuries and all these changes. Is this going to trickle down to NXT at some point? To where they start bringing guys up? I mean, end of the day, NXT is a feeder, sips, a feeder system. That's what you know? it's for. It is uh, its own brand right now and really probably is the best thing WWE has going right now. 
But at the end of the day, it's there to feed the main roster. So when do they start plucking that thing? And, you know, when you look at the NXT, who benefits them? There's two guys I can see that benefit them without a lot of work being done, um, and that's Finn Balor and Samoa Joe. So maybe yes. this turn of events turn of events really um, is to the benefit of those two guys. And they just booked Samoa Joe and Finn Balor for that London show in December. Did you see the turn? Yes. That was amazing. Out of that nowhere. That was so awesome. Put, put Samoa Joe with Paul Heyman. That's oh what I'm going to say. Put Samoa Joe with Paul Heyman. Uh, Samoa Joe almost should have been called up for this tournament. Like, like he could easily slide into the top mix right now. No question about it. And you need you need guys like him. Well, speaking of Samoa Joe, we got to go out on the Joe theme. I oh, mean, for sure. We we open the show with it and we'll end the show with it. I think that's now the official uh, Super, Super show show. theme. Well, boys, do you say we do you say we do this all again after Survivor Series? Because I think whatever happens, it's going to be newsworthy. Oh, the show's going to be extremely newsworthy. It will be extremely yeah. newsworthy. Will it be disappointment, or will it be? Will we be elated by what happens, and could it be this great ending of Survivor Series like we haven't seen in a long time? Because Survivor Series has been a pretty uh, missable, lackluster show, really, for the last few years, in my opinion. Agreed. Well, we'll have to wait and see, guys. But uh, there's certainly a lot to talk about and a lot going on in the world of wrestling. I gotta say that much. So it's good to be back in the office. Good to be talking with you guys. Uh, any final thoughts before we get out of here? No, I'm just going to keep my eyes open, man. I think there's some great stuff coming, and, uh, and well, hopefully there's some great stuff coming. Either way, however this shakes out, is going to be interesting. Absolutely. Uh, NXT also, you know, now starting to run these ads for uh, Biff Busick and uh, Rich Swan, two awesome new wrestlers of NXT. People are familiar with them from the Indies. You know what these guys bring to the table. So to think that if, if talent gets plucked from NXT, that there won't be more flowers blooming you know, you're definitely not right there. Uh, for myself, from Shotgun Shan, from Sean Cunningham, you want to give any final thoughts? I just want to say it's going to be a busy, busy time, and there's going to be even more wrestling to watch, and it's going to be good wrestling, so I'm excited. Yeah, even with this title tournament, I mean, whether or not you, like, you know, think everybody deserves to be in the title tournament as world title contenders, there's going to be a lot of good matches coming up. From myself, from the Commissioner Man, and Shotgun Shan, we want to say peace. Love and Shanzi, like you've done so many times before, tell him the rest. Wrestling, are you revolution?